Brown Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. How do you do, ladies and gentlemen? This is Carter Brown with another of my stories for you. There's drama and suspense in the scream of a jet plane through the blue. There's more drama and suspense when the plane crashes and no one knows why. That's the basis for my book, High Sky Hoodoo, the story of Whitney Kent, jet pilot and war hero whom everyone calls a jinx. And here he is to tell you about it. It was great to be back, to be standing in the sunlight with the sight and sound and smell of aircraft all around. Ahead of me, I could see the lean, lethal lines of the F-92K, Kent Aircraft's jet fighter. Beside me, I could see the lean, lovely lines of Sue Pearson, Kent Aircraft's secretary. Now, that is my old man's secretary, and he is Kent Aircraft. As the pilot, Hank Jordan, lit the torch and the twin gents built up, Sue Pearson turned to me. What are you going to do now you're back, Whitney? I've made a resolution to get to know some of the people who work here better. You know, see as much of them as possible. <laughs> Lose that look in your eyes when you say that, Whitney. You make me feel like a bargain in the slave market. What's going on here this morning? Uh, this is this a test flight? In a way. He's moving. It's off the ground. There he goes. You sound awfully tense, Sue, for a routine test flight. It's not a routine job. Where have you been the last six months, Whitney? Haven't you been reading the papers? I've been too busy selling that fighter, remember? I come home with orders for the factory's entire output for the next two years. Not a bad effort, huh? Not bad. Just wasted. What? Didn't you know that all F-92Ks have been grounded for the last six months? Grounded? Oh, didn't your father tell you? I saw the great Chuck Kent for exactly five minutes yesterday. He said hello, and he was busy, and he'd talk to me today. You know how well we get on. Whose fault is that? Skip that. I want to know about this grounding. Why? What happened? The Air Force took delivery of a dozen. Five crashed in one week. Five men killed. What went wrong with them? No one knows. They think it's got a jinx. And what's that one doing up in the air now? Gene Latimer and his boys went over with a fine micrometer or something. They worked on it for six weeks. They say it's perfect. We're finding out now if they're right. That explains the little huddle over there. The old man, Latimer, Jim Berg. Jim's been guarding the hangar as if it were made of rubies. Using every trick he ever learned in the FBI. And the fourth guy would be the Air Force Observer, right? Yes, Colonel Creston. Now let's go over and join them. I... I don't think that'd be a good idea, Whitney. Why not? Well, I told you they think it's got a jinx and... And they figure the jinx is me? You crashed the very first F-92K, didn't you? And you were lucky. You walked away from it. I didn't walk away. I was ejected away. But you're around now. Five other pilots aren't. Of all the... I'm not the first guy to bend a plane on a test flight. Since when was it a test flight? You were higher than a kite, Whitney, and you know it. So I'd been drinking. I'd like to know just how many guys in Korea flew down Mig Alley without ever having an alcoholic blood count. So that's the way heroes are made. Is that how you collected your ten MIGs? Stew to the gills? Sure. I was always plastered. That's how I got ten. It was really only five, but I was seeing double. Witty Whitney. Jordan! Jordan, answer me! Is anything wrong? Something's happened. That's Gene Latimer on the VHF. Jordan, answer me! What's happened? It's nothing, Sue. Jordan's radio's packed up. That can happen any time and often does. Latimer's feeling the strain, that's all. He's all tensed up, I guess, and... There's the boom. Yeah. Jordan's gone through the sound barrier. He must be diving to do that. The F-92K is not fast enough to crack the barrier at level flight. Can you see him? No, I can hear him, though. There he is! Latimer's seen him. I have two, and he's... Get on. Get on, everybody! He's going to crash! The wings! They're coming off! He'll hit any second! <laughs> Come 
Come in, Whitney. We've been waiting for you. Okay, so let's all gather around the conference table, huh? That's right. You know Gene Latimer, of course. So these two gentlemen have been new to you. Milton Moore. How do you do? And Owen Hallmeyer. Hello. They have recently joined me, Whitney, as fellow directors of the company. Now, what we're here for is to find out what's wrong with the F-92K. The Air Force recognizes it as a good fighter. They'll buy it, but without any bugs in it. I've talked to Colonel Creston, and his suggestion affects you, Gene. He admits you're a brilliant designer, but he thinks maybe the fault is some little thing that you may have been too close to to pick up. In other words, an engineering mistake. Hasn't a good colonel thought of sabotage? Sabotage with the other five, too? In places that range from Las Alamos to Detroit? Why not? I checked that plane nut by boat. There was nothing wrong with it. What else could it be but sabotage? And I'm looking right at the man I think's responsible for it. Meaning me, Gene? Meaning you, Whitney. You crashed the first one, set us back months. What did you do to it this time? Now, hold on there, Gene. I questioned Jim Berg, our plant security man, about that. He put seals on the hangar and had guards watching it all night. Hey, Chuck, if I can interrupt right here. Sure, Milton, go ahead. Accusations and suppositions will get us nowhere. Then I say let's call in the police. Uh, no, Mr. Latimer. In my opinion, that would be fatal. It would completely destroy confidence in Kent aircraft. Now, Mr. Holmeyer and I, as co-directors with Mr. Kent, are concerned with facts. Sure are. And with profits. We're not in this for sentimental reasons. And facts are just what we haven't got at the moment. Now, immediately I heard of the five crashes out of the dozen planes the Air Force took, I embarked on a certain course of action. I called in the Blue Circle Detective Agency from Los Angeles. They have a fine reputation, and I asked them to conduct an investigation. Without discussing it with Owen or myself? Yes. I thought I was justified. And in view of this morning's tragedy, I think I was right. But, of course, I'll abide by my co-director's decision before going any further. Well, I guess it sounds all right to me. I say go ahead. What do you think, Owen? It's a bad business altogether. The sooner we find out, the better, and there's not much use having the police snooping around if there isn't any sabotage. It'd be the very worst kind of publicity. I'm glad you agree with me. Meanwhile, Mr. Latimer, you will, of course, devote your attention to checking on Colonel Creston's idea. Oh. Yes, I'll go over the next one personally, even though I think it's a waste of time. The boys around the factory say there's a jinx on the F-92K, and for my money, that jinx is our war hero here. I've had about enough, Latimer. You're accusing me of murder. Murder? Sure. If that plane was sabotaged, then whoever did it killed the pilot, Hank Jordan, as surely as if they put a knife in his heart. I... I didn't... No, you didn't think of that. Maybe next time you use your brains before your mouth. I think I'll be moving along, gentlemen. Nobody needs a salesman right now, I take it? No. You can go, Whitney. I, uh, thought I'd move out of the hotel into the old beach house if you're not using it, Chuck. Yeah, sure. Come up to the house for dinner tonight. Well, uh, you'll be welcome. Okay, I'll see you then. So long, everybody. I headed for my hotel to pack my stuff and to move it out to the beach house. On the way over, I wondered about the two new directors, Moore and Hallmeyer. What were they doing in the setup? Chuck hadn't said anything to me about them before. But then the old man and I hadn't been... All that close. When I opened my hotel room door, I got a surprise. It had an occupant who was busily going through my suitcases. What's this? Government census? How many pairs of socks does the man back from Europe carry? You're Whitney Kent? Check. Who might you be? My name's Slade. I'm with the Blue Circle Detective Agency. And what are you doing here? Checking. Oh? On whose orders? My boss, Mr. Van Eck. And who gave Mr. Van Eck his orders? That I was to be included in the investigation of Kent Aircraft. The new director, Mr. Milton Moore? Look, I'm just doing a job. The wrong job, Mr. Slade. Out. Now, wait a minute. I said out, and I read it. <laughs> We're a hard-headed clan, the Kents. And we use our heads right in the other guy's solar plexus. That's the Kent guided missile known in barroom fights from Tokyo to Pusan, Mr. Slade. You... <coughs> Don't move. Get your breath back. And I'll get my cases and go. I was leaving anyway. I'm glad you came with me. So am I, since you asked Sue as well. I didn't realize your confidential secretary was 
that confidential. Whitney can't avoid it. Don't us. take any notice of him, Sue. I'll do better. I'll take an axe to him. <laughs> hey, how was Europe, Whitney? Fine. In Paris, there was Fifi, chic and shapely and using such an expensive perfume. In Belgium, there was Fifi, still using that perfume. In London, there was Margaret. What happened to Fifi in London? Can't you guess? She ran out of perfume. You've always got the smart answers, haven't you? I wonder why. Defense mechanism, Chuck. It's a long time since I had to talk to you, son. I tried to, anyway. Grew up too quick for me, I guess. I never had time to get away from the plant, and then when I did, you were in Korea. It doesn't matter. It was tough enough being Chuck Kent's son while you weren't around. If you'd been around, it only made it tougher. I never knew it was as bad as that. Well, we both had it tough, I guess. You lost a wife, the mother I never had. It's old history, Chuck. Let's skip it. Uh, how long have you had these guys Moore and Holmeyer in with you? I had to bring them in, Whitney. Expansion was too rapid. I needed capital, and they had it. That Moore seems like a smart guy. He is. He was with Ace Aero Corporation before he came in with me. Built them up out of almost nothing. Holmeyer's a Texan. Oil money. Likes to speculate. This experience might change his mind. And how about me? Yeah. What do you mean? I'm back, having sold a lot of planes we can't deliver right now. So what next? You mean, what are you going to do? Just that. Well, you've been working hard over there. Take a rest, Whitney. Three weeks vacation at least. We will talk about it after that. Thanks, Chuck. That's all I wanted to know. Now, what's that supposed to mean? I couldn't help wondering if you've subscribed to Gene Latimer's theory that I'm responsible for sabotaging the F-92K. Now, wait a minute. Obviously you do. Otherwise, you wouldn't have suggested that vacation for me. Whitney, you're wrong. I don't think so, Sue. You don't mind if I don't stay for dinner, Chuck? It'd choke me. I leave you with one statement. I'm going to find out what's wrong with the F-92K if it's the last thing I do. Carter Brown, Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown. dawned bright with determination for me. The old man and Sue Pearson may have taken what I said for bravado, but I was determined to prove that the jinx tag they'd fixed on Whitney Kent was a lie. I decided to say nothing about the visit of Slade, the blue circle detective agency man. That was something I'd take up later with Milton Moore. First, I wanted words with Jim Berg, our security man. Well, morning, Whitney. The super salesman with a no good product. Well, you got my sympathy, pal. Thanks for nothing. What gives, Jim? Anything new? Nah, not a thing. The top brass are in conference this morning. They're going to use Hangar C to start on the next F-92K. I got to have four guards around that building night and day from here on. Who gets in? Only the staff connected with the work. And the executives? Oh, I'm sorry, Whit. You're not included. It was your father's instructions. Oh, that's okay, Jim. He told me to take three weeks vacation. Looks like he means it. You have any leads? No. I figured Gene Latimer made a mistake somewhere, like the Air Force character says, but hey, I'm no engineer, just an ex-FBI man trying to make a living. So I have to presume the plane was sabotaged. Right now, I'm starting a double check on all the employees who could have gotten near that plane. How many of them are there? Oh, over a hundred. Looks like quite a job, doesn't it? Mr. Berg, I wish you luck. You will need every ounce of it. Well, you're around bright and early, Whitney. Just paying my round of calls. Chuck in. He's got Mr. Moore with him. Then maybe I won't bother. I've got something to say to you. Anything from those luscious lips I will listen to with pleasure. Not this you won't. It's about last night, the way you talked to your father. Why can't you even try to appreciate his point of view? His point of view goes no further than Kent Aircraft. Everything else runs a bad second. You're a fool, Whitney. And you're a beautiful girl. But if you don't stop worrying about your boss and start enjoying life, you'll look in your mirror one fine morning and realize it's too late. You'll finish up senior stenographer till they pension you off. 
Oh, Sue! Mr. Kent free at the moment? I'm sorry, Mr. Latimer. He's in conference. Well, I'll uh, see him later. Uh, just a minute, Gene. I'm busy, Whitney. Not too busy for what I've got to say. I've thought of a perfect solution to your problem. Oh? Yeah. When you've got this next F-92K ready to test, let me fly it. That's what you've been after all the time. Let's not argue about that. Look at it another way. If the plane's okay, everything's fine. The Air Force resumes their deliveries. The orders I've taken can be filled. On the other hand, if the plane doesn't work, if it goes in the same way that one did yesterday morning, who gets crisped up? You do. Right. So if it does borrow its way into the dirt and takes Whitney Kent with it, at least you know that one line of investigation is closed. Well, what about it? Hmm, it's worth thinking about. I'll devote quite a lot of thought to your proposition. Good morning. Why do you have this hero complex? Why don't you let the experts work it out? People like Latimer and Jim Berg and the others. It's their job. Except for one thing. They can't fly. They can never appreciate how Hank Jordan felt when the plane got away from him. It's beyond their experience. But not beyond yours. Because you're not only a flyer, but a hero as well. Yeah, if you want it that way, that's just how I do feel. You've spent your life shining the seat of your skirt on a stenographer's chair. You don't know any more about it than the rest of them. Who the heck are you to sneer at the guys who fly the planes? I wasn't sneering at the real heroes, Whitney. Only the phony ones. Thanks for those kind words. One of these days you'll eat them. And they'll give you indigestion. I swept out of our office and headed down the corridor to the office of Milton Moore. I figured he'd be finished with his conference with Chuck pretty soon. And I wanted to talk with the new director. It was easy to ignore Moore's red-headed secretary's protests though not her profile, and I settled down in his private office to wait. Is this the customary procedure around here, Mr. Kent? Bursting into people's offices without permission? Oh, I'll give you permission, Mr. Moore. You can come right in. Your kind of behavior is something I am not accustomed to. There's something I'm not accustomed to either. That's having a private detective go through my bags in my hotel room. Oh? A blue circle agent, name of Slade. That's the outfit you engaged, isn't it? What's the idea having them investigate me? Even a young pup like you ought to have sense enough to see that Latimer's accusations against you, wild as they may have been, should be checked. Now, will you get out of my office in a minute? How are things with the Ace Aero Corporation these days? I wouldn't know. How were they when you left? All right. What were they building? Jets, naturally. Bombers or fighters? Fighters. As good as the F-92K? No. Just what is it you're trying to insinuate, young man? I was just wondering. You pulled Ace Arrow out of trouble. You put them back on their feet and left them. I wondered why. I wondered if you still had any association with Ace Arrow. Financial association, I mean. It just occurred to me that if you had, you were backing a losing proposition when Kent Aircraft produced the F-92K. Is that all? No. It also occurred to me that, on the other hand, if Kent Aircraft had a lot of trouble with their planes then maybe Ace Aero could buy them out cheaply when the psychological moment came. And if Ace Aero could then build the F-92K without bugs, they could sell them, couldn't they? Are you seriously suggesting that I would descend to murder just to protect my capital? I'm not suggesting anything. I'm only thinking out loud. I must say you go in for original thinking, Kent. I'd better tell you some of the facts of an executive's life. I didn't have any capital interest in Ace Aero for one simple reason. I didn't have any capital. The 25% holding I have in your father's organization was bought with money loaned to me by Owen Holmeyer. He wanted to invest some money in this firm. He knew what I'd done for Ace Aero, so he was prepared to lend me capital to invest. He thought of it as a safeguard for his own investment. Oh, so you see, Kent, that if anyone has good reason for wanting Kent Aircraft to sell their F-92Ks again... It's me. I... I guess so. Now, do you mind leaving my office? I have work to do. Of all the crazy fool things to do... Not to me, Chuck. Mr. Moore was having me investigated, so I thought I might give him a little of the same treatment. I'm not talking about that. Moore had it coming, you gave it to him. Made me feel sort of proud of you. For the first time. No, Whitney. There were many times when you were in Korea when I was proud of you. And I was proud of you in Europe, too. Proving that you could sell aircraft with the best of them. What is this, old home week? But I'm mad at you. How in the name of creation could you do a stupid thing like that? I thought you said Moore had it coming. I'm not talking about Moore. 
I'm talking about that crazy fool offer you made to Gene Latimer. Oh, that? Yeah, that. Latimer wants to take you up on the offer. Hallmeyer and Moore think it's a great idea. What the heck could I say? But you figure it's a great idea, too. That's what I did say. So you're all set to fly the next F-92K. When? Saturday. They're working 24 hours a day on oh, it. Oh, that's fine. Uh, Sue says you've got a hero complex. I think it's a plain darn fool complex. Maybe. But Gene Latimer was right about one thing. I threw the first one away by flying it when I wasn't exactly sober. That gives me a sort of responsibility, Chuck. Boy Scout stuff. It's more than that. That first plane had bugs. If I'd been sober, I could have told you what particular bug it was. But I can't remember anything. Well? Well, I've got a feeling. If that plane still has bugs and I fly it, I think the memory might come back and I might be able to do something about it before it's too late. Well, maybe you aren't such a darn fool after all. You really want to fly the F-92K? Of course. Okay. That's what I wanted to know. That it wasn't just bravado. What you say makes sort of sense, I think. Thanks. You, um, uh, comfortable at the beach house? Sure. Anytime you feel like eating real food, come up to the house for dinner. Thanks. Now get out of here. I'm busy. Okay. I'll leave you to it, Chuck. Well, congratulations, Whitney. On what? That interview with your father. Oh. The perfect secretary. Keeps the intercom open so she can hear everything that goes on, huh? Well, I don't make a habit of it. But I did that time. Come here, Whitney. What for? I'd like to kiss you. Well, to what do I owe that tremendous experience? You could call it an apology. I was quite wrong about you, Whitney Kent. I'm sort of glad I was wrong, too. I'd spent a lot of my time waiting, especially in Korea. But no waiting time was as bad as the days while the F-92K was got ready. Came Friday and I went down to the plant. The old man was with me. We're fixing the takeoff at 7 a.m. tomorrow, Whit. I've got it cleared with the Air Force, okay, 30 minutes. They've defined the area and so forth, so you can collect all the dope this afternoon, met reports, etc. Sure. I thought I'd collect some flying gear today. I've had it taken into the hangar here. Berg's doubling the guard tonight and is watching things himself as well. Good. Well, there's Latimer, stroking the fuselage like it was a tame cat. Hello there, Gene. Hi, Whitney. Well, there's nothing wrong with it. I've checked every inch of it. Then I shouldn't have any trouble tomorrow. Whitney, it occurs to me that I said a lot of stupid things a while back. I'm sorry. That's okay, Gene. I can appreciate how you felt. And that's my gear there, huh? Yeah. I think I'd like to take the parachute out and have a look at it. But it's all packed. Then I'd like it unpacked. After all, I'm flying this butterbox tomorrow. Okay, Whitney, whatever you say. I had a queer crawling feeling along my spine. And when the chute was unfolded and billowed out in the hangar's expanse, I realized why. There was a six-foot slit across the center. That chute wouldn't have brought a mouse down safely, let alone a guy of my weight. Latimer, what's the meaning of this? Don't ask me, Mr. Kent. As far as I knew, that chute was checked and packed properly. Lucky for me, I took a look. I think I'll borrow one from the Air Force and bring it along in the morning and... Put it in myself. Wait. If they could do that to the chute. Yes, Chuck. What could they do to the plane? Carter Brown, Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense. Based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation, Carter Brown.
Saturday morning at a few minutes to seven was fine and clear. Swathed inside the anti-G suit, sitting in the cockpit of the F-92K, I had only one idea in mind. To call a halt to the hoodoo on Whitney Kent and the plane at one and the same time. I waved a hand to the anxious group at the rail. Chuck, Hullmeyer, Moore, Jim Berg, and Sue. Then Gene Latimer's voice crackled over the radio in my eardrums. Whitney, can you hear me? You getting me okay? Sure, Gene. Loud and clear. Okay. Take her up to 40,000 feet, then 20 degree turns. After that, you can go into the other tests. Okay, Gene. Here we go. The takeoff was routine. I was used to the sloppy, clumsy feel of a jet at slow speeds. You have to throw the stick around like a barge pole before you get any results. Once you get them into their own element, into the stratosphere, then, brother, just breathe on that stick and you get a response. How you doing, Whitney? Everything okay? Smooth as silk, Gene. She lifted nice and cleanly. Altimeter's building up to 5,000. No sign of trouble? Not a speck. She's climbing like a bird. I leveled off at 30,000 with a match meter showing a steady 0.8. Nothing to get excited about. Somewhere around 370 to 380 miles per hour. I did the glides. Down to 5,000 feet, then back up to 30. After a routine of these, I did the turns. The F-92K turned nice and tightly with the aid of her flying tail. Our controls have kept the jet flyer's hair from turning pure white. All the while, I kept reporting back regularly to Gene, feeding him the information he wanted. Okay, Whitney. I think you can take her back up to 40,000 and give her the gun. We had permission to break the sound barrier at 40,000. Then the radio cut out. I wasn't worrying. Radios had cut out before. Everything else was still okay. The match meter registered one. The speed of sound. It wasn't the first time I'd crashed the barrier, but it felt like the first time. It always did. But everything apart from that was fine. Then I looked up and saw that the nose of the plane was under the horizon. I eased back on the stick. The horizon stayed where it was. The plane's nose didn't lift. I fed in nose trim. But it didn't make an atom of difference. The nose stayed down. And then I remembered. The memory that had been drowned in an alcoholic haze came back, sharp and clear. The trouble was the flying tail. A jam up locking the mechanism in the full nose down position. But this time I was sober and I knew the answer. There's a manual control so you can cut the hydraulic pressure on the stabilizer in an emergency. I flicked the switch which cut the hydraulic pressure and then I grabbed for the manual control. <laughs> And nothing happened. I tried it again, and again. And still nothing happened. It looked like I'd be going through that ejection routine again. I pulled the blind down sharply over my face. That was the momentary blackout as the seat with me in it jerked free of the plane. Then I found myself in that exciting experience called free fall. Because you can't get anybody to pay for it. Below me, I knew the F-92K would be spinning down a silver streak to its doom. And in my heart was the grateful thought that this time I could be sure of my shoot. All right, gentlemen, let's take it quietly now. Whitney's back, all in one piece for which we're all thankful. Now, maybe we can find out what the trouble was. Sure we can. Because I know exactly. You do? Well, what is it? The flying tail got jammed in the nose down position. Reasonable, Gene? Sure. A slow leak in one of the valves would do it. But what about the manual control? What about the overriding switch to cut the hydraulics? Don't tell me you didn't think of those, Whitney. I thought of them okay, Gene. There was only one thing wrong with them. They didn't work. Didn't? But I tested them that last night around 10. They worked okay then. They must have worked today. If you wanted to sabotage a plane, Gene, a leaking valve wouldn't be hard, would it? No, it'd be darn easy. How about the manual controls? Could you cut through something to make them ineffective? If you were going to sabotage it, Gene, 
Do you think that would be a good system? A very good and very easy system. But what about the other pilots, Whitney? Why didn't they get out like you? Because they left it a fraction too late. I was the lucky guy. I quit early. Well, I guess that gives us the answer. And I'm sure the Air Force will accept it. There's nothing wrong with the F-92K except sabotage. And sabotage in this case includes murder. Five Air Force pilots and Hank Jordan. That means the FBI and the police will have to be brought in on it. Well, I won't be sorry. They're the experts. We can leave it to them. But I wasn't satisfied to leave it to them. I had a couple of ideas of my own. The first meant getting hold of a gun. The other meant a trip to Los Angeles to the office of the Blue Circle Detective Agency. I borrowed the old man's Cadillac, and the afternoon was almost dead by the time I pulled up in L.A. outside the building. I was afraid in case I was too late, but I wasn't. The door of the outer office was open. The office itself was empty. But behind the frosted glass of the inner office door, I could see a figure. I moved in. Mr. Van Eck, I presume? Yeah, yeah. Who are you? Kent's the name. Whitney Kent of Kent Aircraft. Oh. Uh, what's all this, uh, Mr. Van Eck? Suitcases? Yeah, I'm packing. Going far? Well, I, I really haven't made up my mind. There are so many places. And so many airfields, too. Los Alamos, Detroit, Barksdale. You! Naughty, naughty. <clears throat> Don't grab for your gun. <clears throat> Drop this like a good guy. I... Oh. <clears throat> Now. No, don't, don't, don't. Please. Please don't hit me. I won't. I'll just see which is softer. Your head or this wall. <laughs> and again. Don't. Don't. I can't stand it. How many of you were there? How many did it take to sabotage those Air Force planes? Please, I don't. How many? <laughs> two. You and who else? That guy Slade? Yeah. Only the two of us. Please don't hit me anymore. You feel so ashamed. Of what? <laughs> Myself. Who gave the orders? Come on. Would you like me to do some more head bouncing? No, no, please, please. Okay. Who gave the orders? It, it was... Put him down, Buster. Huh? Fight somebody your own size. Slade. That's right. And this time, don't try those bullet head tactics. I can pull this trigger before you're off the floor. Uh, he, he jumped me, Slade. I, I never had a chance. Shut up, punk, and dry your eyes. You're grown up now. What are you, Kent? The scout? Waiting for the reserves to come up? What are you talking about? I told Stupid here we should have got going yesterday. But he figures there's plenty of time. He don't believe what he reads about the cops and the FBI sometimes being smart. So where are they? There's no one around but me and your pal, Van Eck. <coughs> have him! <coughs> My turn, Slade! I'd thrown the little guy at Slade. Two bullets hit Vanek on the chest, but it gave me just enough time to pull my gun and send two slugs for Slade. I took a last look at the two bodies and left. When I got back to the beach house, I found I had a visitor. The old man. Where the heck have you been, Whitney? I've been waiting here for a half hour. Didn't you help yourself to a drink? No. I've been sitting here trying to figure out who was behind the sabotage. You, uh, come up with any bright ideas? No. All I ended up with was a feeling that a nervous breakdown is creeping up on me fast. Well, I can stave it off. I found out who crocked up Air Force planes. Get it? Who? The Blue Circle Detective Agency. Mrs. Van Eck and Slade. Sean, that's great. I'll get the police on it right away. That won't do any good. They're both dead. What? Which leaves me with my suspicions about who was giving them orders, but no proof. Well, come on, who? Who hired the Blue Circle in the first place? Moore. Milton Moore. Only we'd have trouble pinning it onto your new co-director, wouldn't we? Yeah. And it also leaves us without an explanation of the two crashes here. See if we can figure an answer to that while I'm gone. Well, where are you going? Just to put a little emotion of mine into operation. Now, look here, Whitney. If you've got some crazy idea in your head of playing hero... I'm no hero, Chuck. Just a jet man with all tubes blazing. My idea was great, I thought. I drove Chuck's Cadillac down to the plant. The guard on the gate recognized the car and waved me in. 
There was a light on in Jim Berg's office, and I parked outside. The security man would make a good partner in this operation, but in case he didn't approve of it entirely, I decided to uh, twist the story a little. Well, wouldn't he? Kind of late for you to be around, isn't it? Oh, I'd be nosing around. Uh, thought I'd have a chat with you. Well, Any time. You're a number one boy in my books. You proved the F-92 case was sabotaged. Given us the first lead we've had. We've done better than that. Yeah? Well, tell me more. Our security chief's the last guy to hear anything that goes on. I spent some time in L.A. The police were with me. They were playing along with an idea of mine. Oh, what was that? That Bannock and Slade of the Blue Circle Agency were behind the sabotaging of the five Air Force planes. What? What happened? Everything we wanted. The cops have got both of them in custody right now. Bannock cracked wide open, spilled the whole story, how they did it, who was paying them, everything. Well, how do you like that? Hey, Whit, uh, have you got a gun? Yeah. So have I. This one. And that's my boy, Jim. Let's go get the top guy. I've got a better idea. What? That you sit down in that chair and put both hands flat on the table. Otherwise, Whitney, I'll blow you to kingdom come. Brown Mysteries. Adventures in excitement and suspense, based on the best-selling novels by the slick storytelling sensation Carter Brown. I just sat there in Jim Berg's office and stared from his face to the gun held steadily as a rock in his hand. Somehow it took a long time to sink in. The thought that I'd messed it up, that Whitney Kent, jet pilot and so-called jinx, had also been a jerk. Burke moved round behind my chair, felt my pockets and took out my gun. Then he stepped back to the table and picked up the phone. Don't try anything, Whit. I can talk into this and watch you with no trouble. Berg, I got company. Whitney Kent. He brought me some news from L.A. Van Eck squealed. Yeah, that's right. They didn't pull out fast enough. No, he's on his own, I think. Probably had a fancy idea of taking both of us in or something. You'll be right over. Fine. Yeah, we might need a hostage. Okay. Well, I'm finally getting hep. <laughs> Took you a while, didn't it? The perfect setup. The chief of planned security. Who the heck would question where he went inside the plant? Nobody ever did. You could get right next to an engineer and he wouldn't even notice you. You could sabotage the planes. You could split my parachute. Of course. You see, being an ex-FBI man is the best thing a guy can be. Nobody doubts that he's honest. Nobody wonders if somebody comes along and offers him 50 grand whether he'll stay honest. They don't even imagine anybody offering him the dough. And that's where the boss was smart, picking me for the job. He must have picked you long before he joined the firm as a director. From the time when I ditched the first F-92K. That's right, he did. He's been planning this a long time. That sounds like him now. But keep nice and still, Whitney. Oh, Jim, I... Kent! Don't tell me you're surprised to see me, Mr. Moore. What's going on? What's the gun for, Berg? This! Uh... Don't move, Whitney. What's the idea of knocking your boss cold? Him? My boss? You got it cockeyed, Whitney. This is my boss coming now. Well, Jim, everything under control? Holmeyer! What's that fool Moore doing in here? I didn't wait to ask. He just came in at the wrong time. So, you were going to take us in, Whitney, all on your own. I... I thought it was Moore. I never dreamed it was you. I'd have been very surprised if you had. Jim, I presume the police are watching the plan. Well, I guess so. They've been around all afternoon. Uh, Pity we don't have an F-92K. Uh, we could have had our young hero fly us out. Berg, 
You hit me. And I'll do it again if you step out of line. Has everyone gone raving mad around here? No, Mr. Moore. Let me introduce you to our sabotage chiefs. Owen and Berg. That's right. I think you'd better keep quiet. Now, both of you. It's a good thing you called me right away, Jim. Gives us plenty of time. For what? For getting out of here. But they'll be watching the plant. They'll have roadblocks, probably. We don't have a hope of getting out of here unless we make ourselves invisible. That may not be impossible. Can I ask you one question? Sure. It's a one-word question. Why? I guess you're entitled to the answer. Do you know who owns the Ace Aero Corporation, Whitney? The stockholders, I guess. You know who the stockholders are? No idea. Me. You? Through certain dummies, of course. But I made an error of judgment. I thought Ace Aero was the firm to buy. It had a brilliant top executive, Milton Moore. Thank you. But it lacked a designer like Gene Latimer. I had everything but the right plane to build. Kent Aircraft had the right plane, but I knew your father needed capital to expand his production to meet his demand. So I figured the whole thing out very carefully. If you bought into the company, nobody could possibly expect you to sabotage it. Exactly. And by persuading more of my own chief executive to leave Ace Aero and come here too, and by arranging to lend him the money, it meant I had a 50% interest in Kent Aircraft, so nobody could think for a minute I was anything but genuine. Oh, Whitney, I assure you I had not the faintest idea of all this. I believe you. But of course, Halmeyer, long before you bought in on us, you took the precaution of buying Jim Berg for yourself. Of course. I was determined that the F-92K wasn't going to make good. That meant sending Kent Aircraft bankrupt, so they could buy out at a nominal figure. Naturally. And then I'd have produced the F-92K without bugs. A neat little scheme. But it didn't work out, Halmeyer. No. The trouble with being clever is that you have to employ others, some of whom are not at all clever. I got a good man in Berg here. But Berg got a moron in Van Eck. Well, Slade said he was okay, and I figured his word was good enough. Anyway, aren't we wasting too much time talking? We ought to figure how we're going to get out of here. I've already done that, Jim. You have? Well, how? If we can make Los Angeles, we'll be all right. Oh, maybe, but first we have to get out of here, and how are we going to do that? I'll show you. Whitney, you brought your father's car down here? Yeah. Does that make it sound easier, Jim? Whitney drove his father's car down to the plant tonight. He'll drive it back again. I don't get it. I'd have thought a child could understand it. He'll drive it out with the three of us on the floor. They know Chuck Kent's Cadillac, and with Whitney driving it, they let him through. I don't see why that setup shouldn't take us through the roadblocks as well. You're taking more along? We can't leave him here to raise the alarm, can we? Okay, then what are we waiting for? Is that the only gun you have, Jim? Well, there's one on the table that Whitney was carrying. What's yours? The Lugo 32. And that's a silencer on it, eh? Sure. Doesn't make any more noise than a cork out of a bottle. Let me see. Here you are. Thanks. I'd like to know if the silencer actually works. What? You... You, you shot him in... Callously, in, in, in cold blood. I don't need him anymore. And you and young Whitney can call it an object lesson. If Berg had been more careful in choosing the people we needed, Kent Aircraft would have been mine now. I think you're crazy, stark crazy. Am I? <laughs> we'll go out to the car now. You will drive it, Whitney. I shall be on the floor in the back, and so will Moore. <laughs> I'll give you a practical exercise in ethics, Whitney. If the car gets held up for any reason and looks like being searched, I shall shoot Moore first. His life is your direct responsibility. A couple of minutes later, we were in the car. We rolled through the gates. The guard on the gate gave me a smart salute, and then we were out on the highway heading towards San Bernino with Los Angeles beyond. <laughs> demonstrates the power of advertising, doesn't it? They say there goes Chuck Kent's car and never even think that somebody other than Chuck or his son might be in it. I guess not. You can pick it up a bit, Whitney. I needn't remind you that I'm in a hurry to get to Los Angeles. I boosted the speedometer up to 70. I wondered where the police who were supposed to be watching the plant could be. There was no sign of them or of any roadblocks. 
Can't you go faster? You want to get to L.A. in one piece, don't you? What are you going to do when you get there? I have good contacts. They'll just disappear. I meant with the car and us. I'll probably have that figured out by the time we get there. You just concentrate on the road. But I was also concentrating on the rear vision mirror. It was obvious that Holmeyer was going to get rid of me and Milton Moore unless something happened to stop him. Then a pair of headlights gleamed in the mirror. I thought maybe they were the something. I moved my right hand forward till my fingers closed round the switch that operated the head and tail lights. I started flicking the SOS signal with the lights. If the car behind was a police car, maybe they'd get it. Then I heard something which made me sure they had. What's that? Sounds like a siren to me. Police! Just remember, Moore gets it first and then you. I have nothing to lose. I realize that. The police car was practically abreast by now. The driver signaling me to pull over. There was a white fence running parallel to the highway on my right. It wasn't a hard decision to make. If I stopped, the cops would look in the car. Holmeyer would certainly shoot more and almost certainly still have time to shoot me. The alternative at least offered a sporting chance. I swung the wheel over hard. When I came to, I felt peculiar. When I looked up, I realized why. One leg was hanging up high, straight and stiff. And everything around was white except a face which peered down at me. That was red, with anger. I thought you weren't going to play heroes. Now look where you wound up, in hospital with a broken leg. Take it easy, will you, Pop? I had no choice. What happened to Moore and Hallmark? Moore is in the next bed. He's got a broken leg, too. Hallmeyer was the only one who got out without a scratch. What? Only thing is, he started firing at the cops. They got sore and fired back. Exit Hallmeyer. Now, that's enough, boss. I won some time with that son of yours, too. Okay, okay. Well, well, Miss Pearson in person. Come to congratulate me? What for? Well, uh, for my quick thinking, my cleverness, my ingenuity. Huh? Well, if I hadn't given that SOS signal to the cops behind me... They didn't know anything about an SOS signal. They were pulling you over to tell you that your tail lights were on the blink. Oh, no. What's the use of being a quick-witted hero when the cops are so dumb? <laughs> Darling, you're a dope. But I'll kiss you just the same. You know, when you did that, I distinctly felt my broken leg twitch and start to mend. Not for at least three weeks. Three weeks? And a good thing, too. At least I won't have to worry about what you're doing. I'll know. You'll just be lying here. They have nurses here. But you'll never catch them, darling. Not with one leg swung over your head. On the other hand, I'll have you where I want you. When I bring the preacher along. Preacher? I don't want any preacher. But I do, sweetheart. Then I can fix it so you'll always be where I want you. Permanently. This is Carter Brown. You know, when I finished writing that story, I was surprised at myself. I'd actually left with me with some of his bones still unbroken. But I guess you've, you've got to be kind to your heroes sometimes. Well, I'll be back with another of my books for you. The next one's called Crime for a King. And the king in this case is named Roger, a private detective who discovers that diamonds really are some girl's best friends. So this is Carter Brown saying, so long for now. Be seeing you. In High Sky Hoodoo, you heard Pamela Page as Sue Pearson, while as Whitney Kent, you heard our star, Keith Buckley. The Carter Brown Mystery Theatre, based on the best-selling novels by Carter Brown, is dramatised and directed by Morris Travers for Grace Gibson Radio Productions. <laughs>